Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Welcome to Moriel TV, broadcasting God's truth on the Remnant Truth Network. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash with Moriel Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be looking at an interesting subject. I hope we find it interesting and edifying and pertinent to the situation in which we find ourselves in so many respects. But before I do that, I'd like to look at momentarily a, a few questions that we received concerning our current video on the image of the beast. A few questions we've received on our current video, the image of the beast. The first question concerned uh, what I said about the aspects of biogenetic engineering and quantum computing coming together and how that united or in league with artificial intelligence can be setting the stage for what will become the image of the beast. Now, I did not say this prophetically or anything of that nature. I was simply looking at the evolution of technology and trying to show how it is evolving in line with what Scripture said. Um, please avail yourself of, of the video if you, if you haven't seen it. I'm not into conspiracy theorists. I was not speculating. I was simply pointing out something I believe that the Lord's Word does say, and it is very much in harmony with what's happening technologically and so forth in the present climate, where, as man thought he could take the place of God, artificial intelligence will think it can take the place of man, and how this can come together in the image of the beast. Be that as it may, for 25 or 30 years, I have been making reference to the fact that Jesus was emphatic when he said, not just as in the days of Noah, in the Olivet Discourse, but just as in the days of Noah. When the Nephilim came down to corrupt the human race, and they somehow were able to procreate demonoids. Nephilim from the Hebrew Lipol, the fall. And of course, the Antichrist and false prophet will show signs in the heavenlies. Now again, there's been much conspiracy theory, much nonsense concerning this. It's a very important subject that has to be looked at very carefully, first of all, theologically and doctrinally, but also scientifically. We cannot get carried away with the conspiracy theory nonsense. And much of this has involved crackpot declarations by people who don't know what they're talking about. It was brought to my attention this week that there was a new video by someone I don't really know much about. His name is Billy Crone from a church called Sunset. I take it to be in America. And he was making some statements in an interview with Gary Stearman, of whom I am frankly do not have a very high view doctrinally, not attacking him personally, just doctrinally. I have a low view of him. I don't think he has much of a serious grasp of scripture. But Mr. Crone was making statements about something called encryption and how it could get to the point where is it still a human? Is it still a person by the effect of this kind of uh, phenomena that takes place that's known as epigenetics, epigenetics. Uh, in fact, again, we quote people, they keep saying, not that they're not just doing it, but we quote the scientists, the think tanks, the military experts who are promoting the super soldier technology, genetically modifying the soldiers, just like Captain America, okay, in the Marvel movie premise, they're really injecting into the genome, creating super strength, super vision, mm -hmm. cat-like vision, you can see underwater, you can see at night, uh, you could self-heal, things like Wolverine, all the Marvel movie, comic books, and all that stuff is really becoming a reality. Well, nucleotides are encrypted. That's DNA, RNA, recombinant nucleic acids. They are encrypted. Epigenics is something else. It means epi in Greek, on or around, but it does not involve a change in the DNA. In other words, it's something we say is non-haploidal. Now, admittedly, my own science background, my own biomedical background is greatly outdated. I remember very little, 
Most of it is either forgotten or outdated. I do remember my genetics uh, professor, Dr. Jett, remarkable woman. She co-invented the technology for diagnosing uh, sickle cell anemia. And she was a consultant to the biogenetic engineering industry in its very early days in the 1970s. And she made a lot of, a lot of money. I remember we used to drool looking at her two automobiles. She had two Porsche sports cars of the same year. Uh, one was orange and one was blue. <laughs> that, that's how well she did. She did much better in industry as a consultant than she did in education. But a lot of people are in education not to teach, but to publish papers because that raises their profile in industry and they get advisory contracts and consultation contracts. And that's, she was somebody who was basically teaching in order to be able to publish papers and get an academic reputation so she could market herself to these biomedical companies, pharmaceutical companies and so forth. But she was a very clever woman, very clever. You know, many physicians tend to be women who are very good, particularly in things like pediatrics, neonatology, because one, women can multitask naturally better than men, and secondly, they're intuitive. Women can make very, very good physicians, particularly in certain specialties. It might cost them their ambitions of being a wife and a mother because it takes so much time and so much work. But, and I know, I know women physicians that they blame their profession, they blame medicine for the fact that they never married and had a family, that, that happens. But the fact of the matter is there's many women who are very good at med medical science in terms of practice, in terms of being clinicians in certain specialties. Most of the best surgeons, most, not all, but most of the best surgeons tend to be male, and most of the best medical scientists tend to be male, most. But there are exceptions, and she was indeed an exception. She really knew genetics. Um, she knew it too good. She should have been supervising postdoctoral students, not teaching people doing a first degree. But that was, that was her. Uh, I read these things today in the journals, and the science journals and the medical journals, I read the Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm telling you quite honestly, half of it is completely new to me. And some of it, probably between a quarter of it and a third of it, I don't understand unless I read it three times or four times sometimes. Uh, I'm not speaking here professionally in, or any kind of professional capacity. I don't have those credentials. But certainly... Billy Crone doesn't. He did not know the difference between a phenotype, that which is phenotypical, and a genotype, that which is genotypical. He talked about epigenetics without knowing how it actually worked. He didn't understand autosomal molecular structures. He didn't understand haploids and diploids, obviously, or he wouldn't have been saying the things he said. Epigenetics affect observable characteristics of something that does not involve alteration of DNA. It does not involve DNA, and it deals with things that are not hereditary. In other words, it deals with phenotype, phenotype. The identity of a species, however, is something that occurs within what's known as the genus barrier, the genus barrier. And the identity of a species within the genus barrier is genotypical. It has to do with genotype. Epigenetics does not affect genotype. What species you are is a genotypical determination haploidally. He didn't seem to understand the difference between not only mutation and permutation, but the difference between permutation and mutinogenesis. If you're going to attempt to cross the genome barrier with biogenetic engineering, there must be gene splicing. You have to have the correct enzyme that divides a chromosome and then reseals it after you replace it with other uh, chromosomal material, with other genes. 
he doesn't understand what he was even talking about. He was saying that by epigenetic means, you could get to the point where a species would not necessarily even be the same species anymore. This is impossible. Phenotype is phenotype. Genotype is genotype. Phenotype is non-haploidal, non-diploidal, essentially. It doesn't affect species identity. The genus barrier is a genotypical function and entity, not a phenotypical one. One has to do with heredity, the other does not. Now again, I'm not an expert, but I know the basics. I can tell you what he was talking about was nonsense. And of course, as usual, Gary Stearman, yes, uh uh-huh, yes, uh uh-huh. The guy was on there trying to sell a book that was scientifically implausible. It was very bad science, and frankly, it was bad theology. Now, here's the problem. Just as in the days of Noah, just as in, it's emphatic. Jesus was emphatic in the Olivet Discourse. It's going to happen again. We're going back to Genesis 6 in some way. And we can look at the science responsibly in light of Scripture. But we have to be very careful about pronouncing things as this is it. That's true when I was dealing with the mark of the beast on the previous video and on the image of the beast, and it's true with this. It is absolutely essential that if you're going to deal with science theologically, you have both good theology and good science. We see this in fields like creation science. The reason I love people like Andy, Dr. Andy McIntosh, Professor Andy McIntosh, Professor of Combustion Theory, who's an evangelical Christian creationist. The reason I like John Mackay, who's a mineral geologist. The reason I like Dr. David Rosevier, a biochemist. The reason I like these creationists is because they have both good theology and good science. To be a good creationist and a good apologist for the creation. You need both good theology and good science. Well, this is the same principle applies. Billy Crone did not have good theology, and he did not have good science. I'm not saying that he's not a believer. I'm not saying he's not saved. I'm not his judge. But, but that video and that thing with Harry Stearman was just nonsense. Don't confuse it, please, with the things I said in my previous video. It's just not something I would take seriously, and I don't think you should either. Uh, What he said was just not plausible, and it displays an obvious ignorance of, of, of the things he was talking about from a scientific as well as from a doctrinal perspective. But let's go on to the second question we had. It concerned the difference between those who are sealed and those who had the mark, how God seals, but the Antichrist marks. They were sealed of the Lord, or they were sealed. That word is uh, enfagimenon, enfagimenon, enfagimenon. Okay, those are the sealed of the Lord. But then there is the kerygma, not to be confused with kerygma, which is preaching the gospel in Greek, but kerygma, an etching or branding, something that actually cuts into the skin. What I didn't say, and perhaps I should have, my apologies, was this. The reason that God does not want us to take that mark, which obviously represents the worship of the Antichrist in his image, but underlying that is this. Antichrist is in place of Christ. He wants to be in place of Jesus, in place of the Messiah. He is the ultimate quintessential false Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 49, we are engraved in his hand. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, wants us engraved in his hand. The nail marks, he was pierced for our transgression. Our names are engraved for eternity in his hand, according to Isaiah chapter 49. The Messiah, the Christ, wants the name of the redeemed engraved for eternity in his hand. The Antichrist is different. He wants 
his name engraved on people's hands. Christ wants people's names engraved on his hand, actually Yad in Hebrew, arm, hand is the same word. Uh, Kiros is the word for hand in Greek, but he, he wants it engraved in his hand. Now notice it's the right hand. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Repeatedly, in Old Testament typology, the Messiah, Jesus, is typified by the right hand. Yahweh will bring salvation with his right hand. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Or I will say, he will save with his right hand. Um, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. If God can forget his promises to Jerusalem, he can forget his own son. The right hand of Yahweh is always a picture of the Messiah as salvation in the Old Testament, a picture of Christ. Hence, the Antichrist wants it on the right hand. Forehead, hand, what you think, what you do. Now, when we are used to do our Bible study tours of the seven churches in Turkey, I took people often to the cardio leading into the Agra, the market in Ephesus. This is sacrosanct turf in Christian history. Christians who wouldn't worship the emperor were tied to poles and set alight and used as street lamps to illuminate the way into the market because they wouldn't worship Caesar as the son of God. There was a gate on the cardio entering into the Agora, the market, that said, uh, Caesar Rios Deon, Caesar, son of God. Again, this is Antichrist. Jesus is the son of God. You couldn't buy or sell. You couldn't go into the market unless you recognized Caesar as the son of God. Christians wouldn't do it. They were brutally persecuted. Now, as I've said, this is a picture of what will happen at the end of the age. It would appear in the thinking of most Christians that the mark of the beast will be a currency system. I wouldn't argue. They may very well be correct, the number of his name. But what it really says is it's a permit to be able to buy or sell. We explain this on the location messages of Ephesus. If you go to Ephesus, uh, you'll see it, and it's a fantastic place to visit. It's now next to a Muslim village called Serchuk, near the port of Kusidisi, Kusidisi. And it's very well excavated now. It was not when I was younger, but now it's extremely well excavated. Remarkable place. You can go where Paul and Alexander were, where they had the riot in the stadium. It's an incredible place. They believe they know where the grave of the Apostle John is when he returned from Patmos after the persecution of Domitian, when he wrote the book of Revelation. It was there. It was there where he was with Polycarp and his disciples, the last apostle alive, John. Amazing place. Peter was there. Paul obviously was there. But in Ephesus, they had the entrance into the market, Caesar, son of God. You had to acknowledge Caesar as the son of God, worship him as the son of God, in order to buy or sell. No one can buy or sell unless he will recognize the Antichrist as the counterfeit of Christ, as the deified emperor was the counterfeit of Christ. One is a type of the other. It's like a permit that you can't do it without recognizing Antichrist the same as it was with the emperor. Now, this mark that will come, again, it is the Antichrist satanic counterfeit of Isaiah 49. And Isaiah 49, you are graven of my hand, the redeemed of the Lord, a graven of his hand for eternity. The Lord wants people's names, our names, engraven on his hand. The Antichrist wants his name engraven on people's hand hands. I should have perhaps explained this better in the previous video, but I'm trying to correct it now. Bear with me. I'm a very fallible individual. Um, so that's 
the two main questions we received concerning last week's video. I hope this clarifies matters for people. But let's move on to the subject I want to talk about today on this video. I want to talk about something that's not easy to explain. I'm going to be as sincere and as honest and personally candid as I can because it involves personal issues to a degree, although the thrust is going to be doctrinal and theological. Um, there are some people who are false teachers who you can easily disagree with. But there are other people who most of what they teach is right, where well, you may disagree with them on certain things, but you can't write them off as false teachers. And they can be good people. Now, people can be confused as how to distinguish one from the other. We've explained many times about what Peter said concerning parasogzusin, parasogzusin, putting truth next to error, parasogzusin. They camouflage truth with error. There's enough truth in what they say to masquerade the error as in a little leaven leavens the whole lump, a few drops of arsenic in the beverage that is otherwise good, but it'll kill. It's mostly good, yes, but what's wrong is wrong enough to kill you. There are people like this that much of what they say is true, much of it. One is Michael Brown. Michael Brown's eschatology is broadly in line with my own. Michael Brown opposes replacement theology. Michael Brown understands what is wrong with the reformed cessationism of John MacArthur and his syncophants. He's the same as me on all those issues. He says the same things and has beliefs identical to my own. He has spoken out publicly against homosexuality and same-sex marriage. So much of what he says is not only compatible, but essentially it echoes my own convictions. This is Michael Brown. But there's no getting around the fact that he's a proven false prophet. That what he did in Jerusalem in 1988 with the forest fire prophecy, and his promotion of, of, of the Pensacola deception, the counterfeit revival, and then his endorsement of the mysticism and Gnosticism of Bill Johnson in Redding, California, these new apostolic reformation people. It's deadly. So many good things he says, so many right things he says, but they're only there to camouflage the things he says are wrong. You can deal with it. There's another woman who's gained popularity recently who grew up apparently Seventh-day, oh, no, she grew up Christian Science in the uh, uh, Mary Baker Eddy cult. And she became an occult practitioner of some note in the secular world, but now she says she's a Christian and she speaks against error in the church among hyper-charismatics, word, faith, money preachers, etc. It would seem good except she says she came to faith by seeing a vision of Jesus that she described to an artist that she had the artist paint. Now, first of all, Jesus was categorically clear. If anyone says, I've come back physically, don't believe it. He's in the inner rooms, don't, get, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't believe them. When he comes back, it's going to be as the lightning goes from the east to the west. He's coming back the way he left. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Any vision of Jesus in the New Testament that happened after his ascension was always him in heaven. Paul heard a voice from heaven. When Stephen was being martyred, he looked up and heaven was opened up. He saw Jesus in eternity. Uh, John was told, come up hither. Whenever Christ has spoken in a vision or a revelation directly, face to face with anyone, after his ascension, it was always from heaven. If anyone says he's returned to earth, don't believe it. 
That is one of the problems with the Roman Catholic Eucharist. They actually say it is a physical return of Jesus Christ in the Mass that they worship and pray to sacramentally uh, and sacrifice again. Uh, we've talked about this many times. No, Jesus is coming back the way he left. Ultimately, every eye will see. It's not what these people are saying. And her description of him. In the book of Revelation, whenever you see Jesus appearing, even after his resurrection, the stigmata is there. The pierce marks are there. Again, as predicted in Isaiah 49, you are graven on my hand. Where in scripture does a glorified, resurrected Jesus ever appear without the stigmata? That's how he identified himself to Thomas. Now, if you claim you saw Jesus literally, physically, you'd have to see him the way Thomas did, or the way he ascended, or the way he appears in the book of Revelation, at least. His hair was white. The hair in this portrait that this woman claiming to have the vision described, his hair was long, curly brown, but there was no stigmata. He never comes to earth until he returns, until the parousia. Paul heard the voice from heaven. Paul seems to have been taken up to heaven in 2 Corinthians. Stephen saw him in heaven. John saw him in heaven. If anybody has a vision of Christ, it must agree with Scripture, and hers don't, yet she claims this is how she became a Christian. Something is wrong with this. Something is very, very wrong. I can write her off. I totally write her off. Too flagrantly contrary to the Word of God. Let's write her off. And unfortunately, she was being promoted by, of all people, John MacArthur's syncophants, people like Chris Roseborough, and Justin Peters, who, who claimed to disagree with such visions, but they took her on board for some reason. That makes no logical sense, but that's their problem. No, people like that, they may say true things, but whatever they say is true is camouflage. It's masquerading something deadly wrong. And that's what the Antichrist will do. He'll look so Christ-like, he'll look so good, People will think he's wonderful. People will think he, he's messianic until he shows his true colors. This is Parasogzusen taken to its absolute extreme. It's Parasogzusen, as Peter described it, on steroids, putting truth next to error. I can write people like that off. But there's other people I cannot so easily write off. Um, they say things that are not true. They say things that they should not be saying. But I'm not going to say that they're false believers of some malintent. I pointed out, for instance, that Amir Sephardi, who is not a pastor or a leader in Israel, he's a tour guide in Israel, but he is an officer in the IDF and the Reserve in the Milouim, and he is a good political commentator and someone who looks at political events and strategic events in Israel in light of biblical prophecy. When he stuck to that and did that, it was quite good we endorsed his ministry. When he fancied himself as a Bible expositor, as a Bible teacher, which he obviously is not, definitely is not, it's something he's not called or gifted to do, he got himself in trouble. No man can see the face of God. And God made it clear in that chapter. Yet, who is it that God had Moses talk to face to face as a man speaks to his friend, if not Jesus himself? And we see the theophany of the Lord Jesus in so many places around, along the Old Testament, that we shouldn't be surprised. And it's interesting because it, even the Archangel Michael, I believe, is Jesus himself. Michael, who is like God? A sign to fight for Israel, a sign to lead them into the land. Jesus himself, if he walked them into the land, will he forget about them later? Never. And just 
as he never forgot about his own people whom he foreknew, he will never forget about you. And just as he so much into fulfilling his promises to people who forgot about him, how much more he will be about fulfilling his promises to you. It says something very irresponsible. He's retracted it, but it was extremely irresponsible. It was a Jehovah's Witness Seventh-day Adventist doctrine about Michael the Archangel being a Christophany, about being Jesus and things like this. All right, he's retracted it. But he's out of his league when he tries to expound the scripture. On the other hand, I can't deny the good and true things that he does. Some of his political commentaries have been excellent. I would also pay tribute to him for the following reason. He stood up in Israel and he denounced the influences of the new apostolic reformation that had morphed into some kind of a messianic expression of it and have come into Israel from diasporic Jews from the United States. People like Asher Intrader and people like Dan Juster. He publicly joined an Israeli pastor and warned against these people. Emir was absolutely right. He did a great service to the body of Christ, warning about these messianic slash NAR types, even though they don't want to call themselves that. They have those exact beliefs, false apostles. And he warned about it. And I paid tribute to Emir for having the courage and integrity to do that. Emir... No problem. He was right. But then he gets into this other stuff where he isn't... No, he's, he's trying to be something God has not called him to be. Now, when somebody gets out of their gifting and calling, two things happen. One, they wind up not succeeding, failing at what they're not called to be. But secondly, they also wind up failing at what they are called to be. If they concentrated on what they are called to be and called to do and gifted to do and anointed to do and did it faithfully to the Lord, God would bless it and bless them. But when you get out of your gifting and calling and try to be something God has not called you to be or do, You've got a problem. You're going to fail at what you're not called to do. And he's already gotten himself in trouble with, 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 with Michael the Archangel as Jesus did. And you're going to wind up failing what you are called to do, which would be a shame. He was good at what he did. He was a military officer, a believer, a tour guide. He, he was the right kind of person to do what he was called to do. This was Amir Safadi. But he's a brother, he's a believer, he's out of his league, he's doing things he shouldn't, but he's done things he should. He's done good things. What am I going to say? I can't deny the good things he's done. I don't say that the, the mistakes he's made negate the good things he's done. I don't say that. I appreciate that stand he took against the false apostles in Israel. I think he should be applauded, congratulated. Uh, I just congratulated him or applauded him in Hebrew. I, <laughs> I respect what he did. Other things, it's off. A Michael Brown I can write off. And Amir Safari is more difficult because he's not a willful false teacher, a false prophet. He's ignorant of certain things doctrinally. He's naive. And he's built the following by becoming some kind of a spokesman for the body of Christ in Israel, even though in Israel he doesn't even pastor a congregation. He's not a leadership person inside Israel. His profile is in what we call the Galut, in the diaspora. But, you know, he's Israeli and he's a military officer, and a tour guide, and he knows a lot of pastors from Calvary chapels and things like this. And, he knew our dear friend and brother Chuck Smith, I suppose, and things of this nature. And okay, he is built on it. I wouldn't say capitalized on it, but he certainly built a reputation on it and a, a profile on it. Um, 
I only wish he would stick to it. As a Bible teacher, forget it. But I'm not going to condemn him as a believer. And I'm not going to deny the things he's good at. I just wish he would stick to those things. Another example. Another example, still, has been one very painful for me. Only a few people around me have known how difficult it's been. Uh, there is a sister in faith in the United States who has courageously and nobly stood up for years against error, against spiritual seduction. And she has done so while being almost alone in her endeavors at times. Uh, I speak of Jan Markell. This sister has nobly and bravely been a kind of an evangelical Joan of Arc in certain respects. I'm not trying to flatter her, but yeah, I, I would see her as not exactly a latter-day Deborah. I couldn't say that, but she's still someone who has stood up for truth, and that has to be acknowledged and respected. I watched some videos of her. On issue upon issue, point upon point, her own convictions, her own warnings were synonymous with mine. The things that her ministry, I think it's called Olive Branch, was saying was exactly what Moriel says. She spoke about the homosexual issue. She spoke about anti-Zionism and replacement theology. She spoke about the ecumenical seduction. She spoke about the new apostolic reformation. Issue after issue, point upon point, she was exactly right in what she said. And for that, I do respect her. I really do. But there are other areas where we disagree. And it's led, unfortunately, to personal acrimony at times, serious personal acrimony, which I not only regret, I apologetically regret it. It never should have happened because she's so right about so much. We're on the same page on so many issues. We really are. Whether we like each other or not, we're singing from the same hymn sheet, reading the same map. We have the same convictions. She and I both believe in the doctrine of the rapture. We both believe it. The only thing we disagree about is not the rapture itself, but the timing of it. Now, as I have said many times, many times, I know that there are people who believe in the rapture as I do. My fellow believers who, like myself, believe in the rapture. But there are godly and well-intended people who will place it at a different point in the constellation of prophetic events. I'm convinced pre-tribulationism is wrong, but I know many sincere Christians who love the Lord who believe it. I would say they're deluded into believing it, but they believe it. They're not bad people. They long for Jesus to come. They see what's happening to the world, to the church, to Israel, and they want him to come, as the early Christians would say in, Ar in Aramaic, Maranatha, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Their sentiments are right. Again, they're in total harmony with my own. But I believe they have the timing wrong. Now the timing of the rapture, as I've said a number of times, it is an important, it is a very important issue for discussion for theological symposiums, for different Christian theologians and authors to put across different positions in an atmosphere of prayer and fellowship and constructive dialogue. It's an important, a very important issue for dialogue, but it should not be a basis for division. It should not be. It should not be. Unfortunately, with some people, it has been. To say 
that, as, as Janie Farrick has said, one of the people she hosts and promotes, that it, those who are doing it are, 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 are satanic, satanically motivated. That this is why even mentioning a pre-tribulation rapture causes so much hostility and so much controversy. It comes packaged with a satanic divisiveness within Christendom. And there's a teaching in the church today. They'll say that the church will go through the first half of the tribulation pre-wrath in the tribulation. I'm going to go on record. I'm going to do this really lovingly. I'll smile. How's that? <laughs> I can't! <laughs> I got to get the vein going in the middle of my head. <laughs> that is a distortion of the scriptures. It is false and it is demonic. There, I said it. Hope you come back. Corey Tenboom is satanic? Dr. Walter Martin was satanic? Charles Spurgeon is satanic? George Mueller was satanic? A.W. Tozer was satanic? Tozer, Spurgeon, Corey Tenboom? Walter Martin, I don't think so. That's a terrible thing to say about other believers who love Jesus and look for his coming, but place it at a different point in the prophetic timeline than you do. It's a terrible thing, satanic. Terrible word. That, that word should not be used lightly. Um, elephant gun should be saved for elephants. I don't know why this happened, how they could say that. Disagree with me? Disagree with pre-wrath or with interest sealed? Disagree? But to get personal and, oh my Lord, and satanic. And this led to personal acrimony, for which I am very sorry. Um, concerning Jan Markell herself, I don't only regret it, again, I apologetically regret the way I responded to some of the things that were said and done with regard to the timing of the rapture against myself and others like me. And I'm not the only one who was the victim of all these responses, but I apologetically regret the way I responded to it at times. You don't like being told you're satanic or that you're crazy. Um, that's just not right. I don't know why they let this issue get to that point. Now, not only do I apologetically regret it happened, my response to it. I apologetically retract for things I have said that may have hurt her in response to things said to me. I think we both need God's forgiveness and we both need to forgive each other. Unfortunately, we're not friends. We will be friends when Christ returns. But unfortunately, in the meanwhile, we're not friends. But we ought not be enemies. I'd be happy to meet privately or with a group of people and dialogue about these differences, try to get some kind of a functional reconciliation as believers in the spirit of Christ. I'd be happy to do that. I'd be very happy to do that because uh, I think it's the right thing to do. She's a woman who has stood up on issue after issue, point after point, and said the right thing and has done so with courage and integrity. Now, when I disagree with her, I want to disagree with her respectfully, honoring her as a sister who stands up for truth. That's how I prefer to deal with her. I have uh, committed, not by the prompting of any person or anything that anyone said to me, just through my own prayer time, I believe the Lord does not want me to be critical of her publicly anymore although I may respectfully disagree with her. Jan, I'm very sorry that these theological and doctrinal differences 
became personal and went to the degree they did. Please forgive the way I responded. I have nothing against you, and I admire and appreciate the many good things you've done despite our differences. Now look, I'm just going to be candid here. I don't believe that you agree with J.D. Farag. I believe that you agree with Dr. Mark Hitchcock, the theologian and attorney, who's, who's a rather brilliant guy. Uh, he's pre-tribulational. I think you agree with him. The idea that the apostasy is the rapture, and that, that J.D. Farag says, and then he renounced it and then went back to it again. I don't think you even agree with J.D. Farag. I don't think you agree with Andy Woods, the hyper-dispensationalist, who says the seven churches in Revelation are seven future Jewish synagogues. I don't think you believe that stuff. I don't know why you were involved with them, but I don't think you actually believe that. I don't think that you believe that Michael the Archangel is Jesus. Let's understand something. There are even pre-tribulationists major pre-tribulationists, like Brannon House, Andy Woods and others, who say Amir Safardi is way out of his league and over his head and shouldn't be doing what he's doing. These are pre-tribulations saying it, not me. I don't think you agree with him about Michael the Archangel. I don't. I don't think you agree that Corey Ten Boom and, and Charles Spurgeon and A.W. Tozer and, and Walter Martin was satanic. I don't think you believe those things. I don't know why you go along with those who propound such things, but I don't think you believe them. I don't think you agree with David Reagan, his annihilationism. That man is an annihilationist. Why you would be in league with somebody who you don't agree with, I don't know. But you are. Do I hate you for it? No. Do I understand why you do it? No. I don't understand it. I don't understand why you make alliances and promote people who espouse things that you not only disagree with, but you rightly know to be wrong. The apostasy is the apostasy. It's not the rapture. The apostasia. You know that. You know Corey Ten Boom and Walter Martin and Charles Spurgeon are not demonic. You know Michael the Archangel is not Jesus. You know these things. You know annihilationism is not scriptural. You know these things, Jan. I just don't understand your actions. I don't understand it. But I'm tired of holding any kind of a personal grudge. I do believe leadership is male. I would like to see a male covering in your ministry when God uses a Priscilla, there's a man with her. When God, in the book of Acts, when God uses a Deborah, there's going to be a Barak, or Yael, there's going to be a Barak. When God uses an Esther, there's going to be a Mordechai. God uses you. I only pray that you will find a Mordechai or that you will find a Barak that, like Priscilla, you will come under some kind of covering. I know you're a single woman. Obviously, it would be your husband if you were not. But I do believe that there is a man somewhere, certainly not me, but a man somewhere, who will provide that kind of covering you need. And I think when you come under God's order, God's going to bless it. I don't think you want to have a Jezebel spirit and behave that way, like the woman is on her own. I don't think that's what's in your heart. Now, what's in your mind is something else. I don't understand your mind. But I believe your heart is sincere and pure. And I respect the many good things you've done and said. I've listened carefully to your videos. And you are a woman of courage and integrity. Even though we all have our blind spots. I certainly have mine. You have yours. I apologetically regret the acrimony that's happened between us, and I apologetically retract things that I've said that may have hurt you. It never should have happened. But let's be honest, there's enough blame to go around. You want to meet, I'll meet.
You want my board to come with me and meet your board? I'll do that. I seek reconciliation. No, we're not going to be friends. We're not going to be allies. I'm not proposing that. I just don't want to be your enemy. You've done too much good and spoken too much truth. You associate with good people like, 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 like Jack Hibbs. You associate with people I approve of. Um, for the most part, I, I agree with Jack on most things. I like Jack. Uh, I, I just don't want this bad feeling to continue, John. But more importantly, I don't think Jesus does. I want to be able to point people to the good things in your ministry that I agree with. Because there are many good things I do agree with. Uh, please forgive any hurt that I may have brought into your life. I did not want to fight with you. I do not want to fight with people who I agree with. Um, we're not in the same ship, but we're in the same fleet. Friends, we are not. Not yet. But I do not want to be your enemy. You've done too much good and spoken too much truth. And I sincerely mean that. And I state these things publicly. But what I'd like to point to something now is the following video clip. Something that Sister Jan Markell highlighted about a person who is called Rick Wiles. Please watch this brief clip and understand her response, which was the correct one. Now, what, what's really tragic, you just saw the world. Now you're going to see Christian persecution, Christian anti-Semitism here. Now, I've been trying to expose this Rick Wiles for years. He's an internet broadcaster. He calls himself an evangelical Christian. I don't know where his heart is. How, he hates Jews. How does he love the Jewish Savior? I don't know. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but not so odd as those who choose the Jewish God but spurn the Jews. So let me just show you a real quick clip of Rick Wiles. This represents Christian anti-Semitism, which is growing, 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 growing in the church. And the root is what? You tell me. Replacement theology. The church is the new Israel. Therefore, we don't, these Jews are just an inconvenience. Again, this is one of the top things to keep your eyes on here in the new year. That's the way the Jews work. They're de they are deceivers. <laughs> they plot. They lie. They do whatever they have to do to accomplish their political agenda. This impeached Trump movement is a Jew coup. And the American people better wake up to it really fast because this thing is moving now towards a vote in the House and then a trial in the Senate. We could have a trial by before Christmas. This country could be in civil war at Christmas time. That's right. Members of the U.S. military are going to have to take a stand, just like they did in the 1860s with the Civil War. They're going to have to decide, are you fighting for the North or the South? Members of the government are going to have to take a side. Instead of north, south, it's going to be left or right. People are going to be forced, possibly by this Christmas, to take a stand because of this Jew coup in the United States. We have weeks to stop it. That's why I'm speaking out. That's why I'm putting everything on the line, saying this is a coup led by Jews to overthrow the constitutionally elected president of the United States. And it's beyond removing Donald Trump. It's removing you and me. That's what's at the heart of it. That's right. You have been taken over by a Jewish cabal, a Bolshevik revolution, and I'm going to tell you, the Church of Jesus Christ, you're next. Get it through your head. Jan puts those comments by this man down to replacement theology. She is correct in what she says. It is theological supersessionism. It is replacement theology on steroids. But it's more than that. There's obviously an anti-Semitic spirit, a demonic influence in what this man says. I have seen this spirit at work in other people. I've seen it in Gary Burge. 
Oh, I think he's a very bad theologian, not, not a very good scholar. I've seen it in Stephen Sizer in Great Britain. I've seen it in that Ted Pike and his wife who committed suicide uh, out in Idaho. I've seen this kind of vehemence before, but what Rick Wiles is saying, he's one of the worst I've ever seen. One of the worst. Who can't you criticize in America? The Jewish lobby. Yes. On both sides. Right. That's right. That's, that tells you who controls the country. But his hands were tied. Who ties the president's hands? Someone more powerful than the president. Yes. The Jewish mafia. I personally believe Israel took out John Kennedy. And it's not Muslims that are going to kill us. It's Jews. And it's not Muslims that are going to kill us. It's Jews. And it's not Muslims that are going to kill us. It's Jews. And it's not Muslims that are going to kill us. It's Jews. Ted Pike is worse than he is probably, but this is quite bad with what we just watched. And Jan Markell has very, very correctly attempted to warn the Christian public about and against this man. In support of what she says, let me respond to him and to what he's saying. Anti-Jewish conspiracy theories is something I've spoken about many times. I went to the same high school and to the same Jewish community center as a kid. I didn't grow up in the Jewish faith, but I was in the Jewish community. Uh, with some very, very nefarious figures. One is the congressman, bad boy Barney from Massachusetts, Barney Frank but he was from near New York. He was from the place in New Jersey opposite the, the Statue of Liberty where, where, where I grew up. He was from the same place. We went to the same high school and to the same Jewish community center. So did Arthur Burns, the former chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve. He went to the same school and same uh, Jewish community center as I did as a kid, same. Now I grew up Catholic, of course, but I was in the Jewish community, long story. Be that as it may, let's understand this. They say Jews control the finance and the banks in the United States. Oh, there are Jewish interests and in Jewish controlled companies in the American banking establishment, Goldman Sachs being one of them. But the biggest banking dynasty in the United States with a Mellon family founded by Andrew Mellon, not Jewish. The biggest banking empire in the United States that exists to this day was founded by somebody who was so wealthy, he bailed out the United States government to prevent the depression. I speak of J.P. Morgan, the most powerful banker in the history of America, if not the world. He was not Jewish. J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley Chase exists to this day. Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, not Jewish. Brown Brothers, Harriman, the investor, investment bankers, Ava Harriman's family, not Jewish. Former chairman of Citicorp, Donald Rist, not Jewish. Former chairman of Chase Manhattan, David Rockefeller, not Jewish. Where do they get this? that it's a Jewish enterprise. No, David Rockefeller was not Jewish. J.P. Morgan was not Jewish. Donald Rist was not Jewish. Chase was not Jewish. Founder of Chase Manhattan. There are Jews in it, but they've never controlled it. Even in Europe, where you have had the Rothschild family for generations, they believed they needed economic power and leverage and finance to stop anti-Semitism. That was the philosophy of Meyer Amstel Rothschild, but they couldn't stop Hitler. 
it just doesn't work that way. Oh, the Jews control the media. They control the news. Even publications that have a lot of Jewish staff, they are left-wing Jews, like the New York Times, not very friendly to Israel anymore to the degree they ever were. Jews control the media? The biggest news enterprise in the United States is News Corp, Fox News, much bigger than MSNBC, much better than, bigger than CNN, much bigger. Rupert Murdoch, Presbyterian, Australian by birth, not Jewish, New York Post, Wall Street Journal, the Gannett's chain, biggest newspaper chain in America, not Jewish. The biggest newspaper magnet in American history. They made the film Citizen Kane about him. William Randolph Hearst, the Hearst family. They still control the newspapers in the Bay Area of San Francisco. Not Jewish. Hearst was not Jewish. Uber Murdoch's not Jewish. Ted Turner, founder of CNN, not Jewish. This is all nonsense. Oh, you have these people attacking President Trump, these left-wing Jews in the media, Rachel Maddow. Yeah, that woman disgusts me. I find that woman absolutely disgusting. Chris Matthews was not Jewish. He's as bad as she was. Chuck Todd's not Jewish. He's even worse. Where do you get this stuff? It's a Jewish enterprise. The Jews control it. Don Lemon is not Jewish. Hates Trump. Hates conservative Christian values. He's not Jewish. Let's look at the terrible TV show. I would never watch it, but I've seen excerpts of it. The View. Whoopi Goldberg may have a Jewish name, but she's not Jewish, and either is Joy Behar. And that other woman, that Hispanic one, was extremely left and extremely anti-Trump. I've seen Janine Shapiro, I've seen go on there, but those people hate Trump with a passion. It's like their religion. None of them are Jewish. They're the loudest voices against Trump. The loudest, not Jewish. No. Jews control the media. <sighs> it's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. Well, let's look at Hollywood. Yes, there's a lot of Jewish talent in Hollywood. Hollywood is something that America has continually and consistently been good at. It's declining now. The film industry as we've known it, Hollywood, is dying. The music industry died, and now Hollywood is dying because of digital technology. Silicon Valley, Netflix, things like this, Amazon, are replacing companies like Paramount and, and, and Columbia Pictures. But Sony is owned by the Japanese, the founder of Hollywood. The founder was Cecil B. DeMille. He was not a Jew. In financial terms, the biggest producer in Hollywood, the biggest, George Lucas, is not a Jew. Now you have Jewish film models who are conservative Republicans. Jerry Weintraub was a Republican. Jerry Bruckheimer, Republican. Not all Hollywood Jews are liberal, like Weinstein. Some are, some aren't. Where do you get this stuff? But let's look at high tech up the California coast in San Francisco and to Seattle, the high tech capitals. Is Amazon Jeff Bezos Jewish? No. Is Bill Gates? Is he Jewish? Microsoft? No. Was Stephen Job, the founder of Apple, Jewish? No. Now you've got Jews in it. You've got Jews in it. You've got Mark Zuckerberg and Michael Dell, who's not a bad guy. 
but you've got Jews in it. I don't like Mr. Zuckerberg at all, obviously, and I, de I detest what's become of Yahoo and Google. I hope they get replaced by market competition, but you can't say that these are Jewish enterprises in, in the Silicon Valley. Some are, some aren't. Yes, Sergey Brins and, and Larry Page are Jews, but it just doesn't work that way. Ellis, the, the, the founder of Oracle, brilliant guy, is Jewish. Yes, there are Jews in it. <laughs> Bill Gates is not a Jew. And, you know, Stephen Job was not a Jew. You can't say that. You just can't say it. It isn't true. It isn't true. Jeff Bezos is not a Jew. Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook is Jewish. Microsoft isn't. Apple, biggest capitalized company in the world is Apple. Its book value is the highest capitalization of any company. It was founded by Stephen Job. Nothing to do with any Jews. Let's move on. America's biggest investor is Warren Buffett a Jew? No. No. Well, what about the Koch brothers? They Jewish? One of them died not long ago, but no, the Koch family not Jewish. What about America's other major money dynasty, the Waltons? They Jewish? No. These are the top. DuPont, they Jewish? No. Ford, Ford family? No. Henry Ford was an anti-Semite. It's ridiculous. Yes, there are Jews in banking, certainly in Hollywood, in industry, and in media. But to say that these things are Jewish enterprises or controlled by Jews is ridiculous. The media in Great Britain is extremely left-wing and extremely anti-Donald Trump. But there is one resounding voice who speaks up for Donald Trump almost every day in Great Brit Britain in the world of journalism, Melanie Phillips. Best friend Mr. Trump has in the world of journalism outside the United States. She's Jewish. This man, this terrible man, Mr. Wiles, says it's a Jewish conspiracy to get rid of Donald Trump. Well, let's look at Mr. Trump's bogus impeachment that never should have happened. Let's look at it. The so-called managers, the prosecutors, were led by two left-wing Jews. Two very wicked men. It was up to me they'd spend the rest of their days in a reopened Alcatraz. Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler. Despicable individuals. To that, I would add Mr. Schumer. A disgrace to the Jewish people, in my opinion. And I don't think much of Michael Blumenthal or Michael Blomberg either, or Senator Blumenthal either. Diane Feinstein, these left-wing Jews nauseate me. But let's look at the trial of Donald Trump. His two lead lawyers, one a conservative Republican, the other a liberal Democrat. Jay Seklow, a Jewish believer in Jesus, someone I know, I worked with him on committees years ago. He's a Jew. Donald Trump's lawyer is a Jew in that impeachment. The constitutional arguments were made by Alan Dershowitz, Professor Dershowitz, a Jew, a Democrat, a liberal. But he had some principle. It was Jews who defended Trump against these ridiculous charges. His lawyers were Jews. They argued passionately and effectively. Oh, the Jews want to get rid of them. <laughs> What's Alan Dershowitz, a pygmy? What's Jay Seklow, an Eskimo? No, they're Jews. I've seen Alan Dershowitz at a lecture. Don't know him, but I've seen him. But I know Jay Seklow, I assure you, they're both Jewish.
The most outspoken supporters of Donald Trump in the media are in disproportionate number Jewish, in social media, talk radio particularly. Let's go through the index. Michael Horowitz, Jewish. Ben Shapiro, Jewish. Dennis Prager, Jewish. Mark Levin, Jewish. Michael Savage, Jewish. They're all Jews. And they're all pro-Donald Trump, vehemently pro-Trump. The Jews are trying to get rid of them. What Jews are you talking about? The biggest funder of Donald Trump's campaign in 2016 was the Las Vegas billionaire Sherman Adelson. He gave $82 million to get Trump and Republican conservatives elected in 2016. Sherman Adelson, billionaire, multi-billionaire, gave 82 million. This year, 2020, for the election in November, he has pledged to Mr. Trump's campaign $100 million. The biggest funder of Donald Trump politically is a Jew. His lawyers, Jews. Most of his biggest supporters in the media, Jews. And this ridiculous, pathetic, anti-Semitic figure, Mr. Wiles, is saying it's a Jewish conspiracy to get rid of him. It's absurd. Melanie Phillips is Jewish. Jay Sekulow is Jewish. You're Jewish. David Horowitz is Jewish. Ben Shapiro is Jewish. Sherman Adelson is Jewish. You've got Jews who are against Mr. Trump. Feinstein, Blomberg, Schiff, Washington Schultz. And you've got Jews who are for him. I can show you as many leading Jews who are for him than who are against him. Maybe more. And I mean people who are really for him, legally and financially. Look at anyone else? You've got Italians who hate Donald Trump. Mayor de Blasio from my hometown, New York City, and uh, Andrew Cuomo, they hate Trump. They're Italians. Charlie Gasparino and uh, Rudy... Giuliani, former mayor of New York City, they're Italians who are for Trump. You got Italians who are against him, Italians who are for him. My mother's family is Irish, Irish Catholic. You've got Irish Catholics who hate Trump. Joe Biden, the governor of New Jersey, Murphy, the governor of Maryland, uh, O'Malley, Beto O'Rourke. You have Irish people who hate Donald Trump with a passion. And you've got Sean Hannity. <laughs> and you've got Judge Kavanaugh. And you've got Bill O'Reilly. Irish Americans who are 1,000% in Donald Trump's corner. Afro Americans! Oh, that Al Green hates him! That Maxine Waters hates him! They hate him! Candace Owen loves him. What a brilliant woman she is. I hope she becomes president someday. I really do. Uh, Nigel Innes supports Donald Trump. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson, pediatric neurosurgeon, member of Mr. Trump's cabinet, supports Mr. Trump. Senator Daniels from Carolina supports Mr. Trump. You've got blacks who are against him, blacks who are for him. You've got that ridiculous mayor of Los Angeles who's against him, who's Hispanic. You've got people like Ted Cruz, who even though they don't get along personally for the good of the nation, supports him 
as does Marco Rubio to a degree. You've got Hispanics who are for him, Hispanics against him. Irish for him, Irish against him. Italian for him, Italian against him. Afro-American for him, Afro-American against him. Jews for him, Jews against him. Don't tell me it's Jews. That is stupid. It is not only dishonest and disingenuous, it is stupid, completely stupid. It is factually unsustainable. Whether Mr. Wiles is an idiot, a bigot, or both, is a determination I will leave to others. But to say it's a Jewish conspiracy to get rid of him when his biggest funders and supporters in the media and his lawyers are all Jewish, Jared Kushner's Jewish. Every one of Donald Trump's grandchildren is Jewish, half Jewish. Every one of them. Best friend Israel ever had in the White House. You think Jews want to get rid of him? That's absurd. Mr. Wiles, I hope you're as stupid as you appear to be. Because if you're not, you're not only an idiot, you're a wicked, bigoted, anti-Semitic liar. One day, you and I both will stand in front of a Jew, a rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minet said it, better known as Jesus Christ. We will stand in front of the Jew. You can save your anti-Semitic and Jew hatred and anti-Semitic rhetoric for him. I'm sure he'd love to hear it. Don't worry. He hears it now. And he keeps a very good record. I pay tribute to John Markell for exposing this guy. And I would point out that among the others who have opposed John Markell is Gary DeMar, a hyper-Calvinistic Reconstructionist from the Dingbat camp of the late Rousas Rashduni. She's a good woman who does good things. Yes, I believe she is mistaken in certain areas, not only in her position but on the way she's dealt with other people who disagree with her, including myself, my friend John Haller and others, she said things I wish she didn't, but I have certainly responded by saying things I wish I didn't. May God bless her. May God use her ministry for good, and may God correct the things in my life and in her life and in my ministry and in her ministry that are wrong. We agree on a number of things. And one of the things we certainly agree on is this horrible man, this horrible man, Mr. Wiles. These are indeed are signs of the coming of the Lord. This increase in Jew hatred is as much a sign of the coming of the Lord as his persecution of the church. And deception within the church includes his brand of deception aimed at evangelical Christians. He's anointed by Satan to try to persuade Christians away from recognizing the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. Well, the return of Jesus depends on the prophetic purposes of God, both for the true church and for Israel and the Jews. To her credit, Jan Markell knows that and says that. And I can only thank her and applaud what she says in this regard. My name is James Jacob Pratch from Oriel Ministries. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.